Hello and welcome to Highlights Presents, the ROI of professional development. We're going to get started in, in just about a minute here and let uh, a few last minute attendees join. Thanks again for joining our presentation today on the ROI of professional development. I'm Scott Taylor and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Just want to get started with a few housekeeping notes here. Um, don't worry about taking notes during the presentation today. We'll be sending a, an email recap uh, with a video recording uh, of the entire deck for your records. Um, if you'd like to live tweet or follow along as we're live tweeting today, please, please use hashtag highlights. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to submit them uh, through the GoToMeeting toolbar on, on the right-hand side of your screen today, um, or just send them directly to us at contact at um, and we'll uh, follow up with you directly uh, afterwards um, after today's conversation. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. Uh, we have Valerie Kovacs, uh, the VP of Marketing at First Federal Lakewood. Uh, and Tom Heilman, the president and CEO here at Heilman Group. Thanks, Scott. We appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks, Val, for joining us for today's important presentation on professional development. Thanks for having me. I look forward to it. Great. So we thought we'd start off on uh, the first uh, a little bit just to review the agenda about what we're going to talk about today. Um, I know at Heilman Group and I know Val, uh, First Federal is committed to professional development. We thought it would be a great topic as we, as we get into December and start to plan the new year with our new development plans and New Year's resolutions and whatnot, to really focus on that. So today we're going to talk a little bit about why professional development is important and why we're also passionate about it. We're going to talk a little bit about how our different organizations have implemented professional development and the different methods for that. And then some key considerations and some takeaways on if you're interested in kind of driving this in your organization or for you and your group personally, what you might do is to get started. So we'll start with the first slide here. Why is this important? So everybody, I mean, everyone kind of intrinsically knows the importance of education in your, excuse me, in your daily job. But what's important, what we see, if you look at the hard, the hard kind of ROI part of this is the what is, why invest in professional development? It's really about getting your, uh, getting your employees engaged. <coughs> And what's shown, a few statistics here from Gallup, that um, showing the, the state of engagement in the U.S. workforce, and it's qu quite frankly terrifying as a business owner to think about only 32, a third of your employees are really engaged at work and really passionate and um, in that a lot of, about half of them are not engaged and some are actively disengaged. And I, hopefully in all of our organizations, those numbers were on the right side of those numbers as opposed to the wrong side of those numbers. But you can see it's extremely um, big problem in business today. So how do you counter that? Well, there's no better way to get your employees engaged than to have them doing professional development and learning and feel like they're thriving with, inside your organization. And the statistics show that Gallup, the strength finders, shown that, that employees who are engaged and working on their strengths 
um, help the organization increase their overall profit. So not only is it best for the employee engagement to maintain retention and growth of those employees, but also it helps the helps hit the bottom line. So that's we're really passionate about it for both the hard and the soft side of the ROI on that. So, you know, now we want to dive into a couple types of professional development activities that can help not only the organization, uh, but the employees within it. So we'll be touching on uh, three of those. First, starting with internships. Um, you know, internships are a great opportunity, not only for students, um, but for the employees of the organization, uh, very early in, in my career, um, I was able, you know, not only took advantage of internships as students, um, and even as a graduate student, um, took advantage of an internship that actually forayed into a full-time position, um, but also early in my career before I was in management, <clears throat> having the opportunity to work with our intern group. Um, so thinking from a professional development standpoint, you know, if you have those high achievers um, and those employees that you're looking to uh, work with to take that next step into management, um, thinking about your intern program and giving those employees the opportunity to manage that program, to do the hiring, the day-to-day -day contact, manage projects, and and um, work with your students um, to get them uh, to work with them through the summer is, is really a key skill. It gives them a safe space to really start to test out and try those skills um, and help you then work with those people to refine refine them. Um, we have a, an internship program at uh, First Federal Lakewood um, in the marketing department and in several organizations, um, and they're really, really key um, additions to our staff, um, and we value the what they bring to the table, not only for their experience and bringing in new ideas, uh, but also giving our, our teams uh, the opportunities. Um, to work with them and to learn from them, and I know Tom at at Heilman, you have you have a really robust internship program. We do. Thanks, Val. No, I wanted to echo um, some of the the thoughts that Val shared. Uh, we spent a lot of time over the last, I guess, four to five years uh, driving our intern program. Uh, we found it to be tremendously beneficial, not only as an educational experience for the um, individual students, so that they can come and experience what marketing or the creative space or technology is really like but also for those existing staff members to kind of understand, as Val alluded to, just how do we interview someone? Because most of the time the, the, the more junior staff haven't been involved in interviewing or in managing the day-to-day -day or in training those individuals. So uh, we even take it a little step farther. We actually have to do reviews. And so to give people the uh, ability to review someone and to talk about learn some of those basic skills with that. Uh, so it's really important to us. We've, we've developed it um, over, the, over several years and kind of refined. We've also found it to be really a valid competitive uh, recruiting tool. So as opposed to being a smaller organization, we can't always compete with a lot of the larger employers uh, in the area in terms of whether it's salary or benefits, but the ability to identify really talented young folks in the internships and, it's, and to kind of vet them versus the Heilman core values um, allows us to make sure we found the right people, get in front of the recruiting time, um, and then help, and then help, kind of build that pipeline. And about it, it's sure. something that you've done over time as well. Yes, definitely. I know, um, you know, our uh, not particularly my team, um, but in the bank itself, our compliance group has a really robust intern program, um, and they have, you know, hired on from there. And exactly to your point, you know, competing with the larger organizations, having the ability to have students in and getting, you know, getting to know them and them getting to know us and being able to bring that talent in um, from, it, it helps reduce that learning curve yep. um, in terms of introducing a, a new employee to the organization um, and it's definitely been, been valuable, been valuable for us. Absolutely. So they get the fact they've already worked in the organization, maybe 10 or 12 weeks, or if they're working throughout the year, more in a part-time model, they're aware of how we how the companies operate. They onboard quickly. What we found from kind of to follow the theme of today's presentation is well, what's the ROI? We found that we've been able to lower our recruiting costs by about 30 percent, 
because the intern with the intern program we've identified qualified content candidates. Um, they've enjoyed working here. They want to work here longer. We bring them in. It saves us on the back end of doing just kind of straight standard recruiting and the cost and time associated with that. And then also what we've seen so far, and then we're still young in the program, being only four or five years in, um, is we've seen the retention from our folks coming out of the intern program is, is longer, um, much longer than what the average tenure might be um, from someone who's just kind of hired in through traditional practices. So we've seen a nice ROI on that. I think we're going to move into the next slide a little bit uh, and talk about um, some other ways. So internships, I think, are a great way for the students to learn a lot, for, for um, younger staff members to get some some ideas and skills in terms of training and working with others in the managerial model. But I know, Val, um, I know from a professional development perspective, um, I know that you you feel very strongly about the value of mentorships and networking. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. You know, I think um, mentorship sometimes can be one of those, uh, it, it can be a little daunting to mm -hmm. figure out how do you approach a mentor? What do you do? You know, how, how do you really get into that type of relationship? Um, and you, from a development side, I think you have to look at a lot of relationships at, in a mentor uh, capacity. So, you know, I think about uh, you know, the relationship that I have with Tom and the team here at Heilman and how my team has been able to learn and grow, you know, from them and for me to be able to, you know, have conversations with Tom about about other um, things that are happening in the business or or this and that. And, and while that's not a formal, you know, get together once a month or quarterly conversation, um, it's definitely helped me to, to improve my skills. Um, I will definitely admit to the group that I have found um, networking later in my career um, and wish and, and really promote that people do it much younger. Um, I've always known and heard of the value. Um, I just have never actively engaged in a networking organization um, until I had the opportunity to get involved with uh, Women in Digital. It's a women um, networking group really focused on digital um, marketing, women in the digital marketing space. And, you know, it has opened my eyes to so much more value uh, that networking brings, you know, being able to sit across the table from peers of mine that are going through the same um, situations and being able to talk to them. We have small group discussions where we, you know, ask um, for advice from women that are in the same career level, um, but maybe different industries, um, you know, we can tap into a network of the full chapter organization across the country. Um, and that's really driven value to my team. I know, uh, you know, all my whole team and, and we're a smaller team, we're four people, we all are involved in the organization um, and, you know, have been able to, to learn from it. Um, and I think it, it's important to find things that fit uh, within your sphere of expertise um, and drive into it because it definitely opens you up to new people in your community um, and and helps you to realize um, more opportunities than maybe maybe you had in in the past. Yeah, I agree, Val. I mean, I think one of my main main mistakes, perhaps in my career, was not to push into the mentoring and the networking world sooner. Um, earlier, I found it a little bit later than I'm, I'm looking back. And if I could start my career over again, I think that's an area I would certainly embrace. I didn't embrace it the first uh, three or four years. And I think had I been able to um, get a mentor earlier on, how much farther I could have progressed quickly, and also the, the networking aspects. So at Heilman Group, we've created a mentoring program, and it's across departments. So we don't have it We don't have them individuals mentored by their manager because that's obviously a different dynamic to a manager's kind of subordinate relationship. Uh, but the idea is kind of giving someone an external view who somebody maybe who's seven or 10 years ahead of them in their career uh, that they can learn from and kind of ask them those questions that they may not feel comfortable asking their uh, boss, right? And so we've built out the mentorship program around that. And I think it really helps kind of leverage that experience, helps uh, make, make an open environment for people to ask like, more experienced folks how they've went about things. Um, I also think it contributes a lot to our company culture. 
one of our um, one of our core values is winning together, and I don't think there's any other better better way. Uh, there's two, two core values here: winning together and growth oriented. If there's any other way to win together uh, more than two people working together towards a common goal for goal for each other, right? And they're uh, each other's development. And I don't know about what your thought is, but when I've mentored, I've been mentoring folks probably for about the last 10 years, I learn a lot more than I think I, than I share with folks. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, you know, I definitely would, would agree. Um, you have the opportunity. I know, um, you know, thinking back on what we were talking about uh, with the internships and how valuable that is, I know that, you know, out of that, uh, for me, you know, I have several people in my network now where, where we don't maybe have a formal mentor-mentee relationship, but I continue to stay in touch with them, um, and we continue uh, to learn from each other and, and take time to meet um, and have been able to work with some of our, you know, former interns on, you know, where they are now in their career pathing and, and helping them get there and you know and talking to them and working through some of those things i take back some of that knowledge to my team you know right. that maybe i wasn't thinking about um and and keep that cycle of feedback right. um feedback going um so like tom was saying you know as we as we think about professional development and and how this is and and how it's worth it you know mentorship is a lot of your time you know that's really where where the expense and the cost is, um, but like we were saying, you know, if you're if you're getting as much as you're giving, then that's you know that's a positive. Um, and if you're if you're like you said with with your cross departmental, you know, if, if teams are helping one another and you're fostering that, I love that win together right. uh, core value. Um, if you're fostering those core values by giving people the time to grow those relationships, you're getting better product and better value Absolutely. out of it. Um, and something like a, you know, a professional development group, those, those fees, you know, and the membership dues to be a part of those organizations can, you know, sometimes be, a bit expensive or, you know, that's a hard cost to your organization. But the way that I look at it is I know that my team has been able to learn from their peers as being a part of women in digital. They've been able to go to their small group peer peer groups and ask questions um, and get feedback that maybe we would have had to bring a consultant in, you know, if we're working through a campaign or we're having technical issues on how to, um, you know, do a LinkedIn business campaign or we're working through that. Um, we can ask those questions of our colleagues because it's a safe space where we're all trying to make each other better. Um, and that's, that's offsetting. I'm not having to go out and find third party um, support to help with that. And that brings the knowledge back to my team and therefore they're growing and developing and thinking um, and, and thinking more about those, those projects and knowing when to take something something to the group. So I feel like, you know, in and of itself, that pays for itself. I would agree. I mean, one of, the, one of as a business owner, an entrepreneur, I'm in an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization. And uh, so to piggyback on your point, it's not an inexpensive proposition to pay those kind of fees and whatnot. But what I've found is I haven't had to cover the same ground or learn as much. I've been able to shortcut a few things. So who's the right bank to work with? Of course, first level. But I mean, who's, who's the right the right attorneys? If you need, what, what about this tax issue? So just like perhaps I can get some consulting from my peers, it also helps me with the network to know when I need to get a tax attorney, who I should go to, right? Yeah. Or if I'm considering expanding the office and, and um, building that out, who do I go to? Who can help me with this? You've been here before. How do you budget for that? How do you do those things? Mm -hmm. So I found that my return, and also you, you tend to get more business. I mean, just simply um, selfishly because um, your employees are out there, you're there, people are, understand your expertise, they want to work with people that they work with, that they know and they trust. So I think that professional development in there. Mentorship, I know that we, we talked about this, it doesn't always have to be a formal internal program. It could be informal people that you meet or know in the marketplace and you could be doing coffee once a quarter or drinks after work and you can, just people who've been from the perspective um, 
well, a lot of times people don't get, get overly hung up on the formality of a mentorship program. I agree. It, it doesn't need to be a written out plan. There may be someone that you talk to just three or three times a year and you want to understand how real estate works or how something does um, from that perspective. So I think, I think you share that opinion, Val. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think, I think sometimes that's a daunting word um, because you, like you said, you feel like you have to have this formal relationship and ask, for the mentor and, you know, establish, like you said, a plan or some sort of thing, but it, it doesn't have to be like that. A mentorship relationship can be those people that you learn from right. and those people that you stay in contact with. Absolutely. So I know, I know there's another, a few other types here, Val, and what, I think that you wanted to talk about one more. Next one. Oh, yes. Um, so sort of wrapping up our, our last point, um, around uh, ongoing education. So what else what else are we doing to help our teams? Um, both both Tom and I. Um, one of the you know a couple of the big things that we do and, and they're easy um, e easy programs to implement with your teams. Um, a couple of years ago our, our marketing team started a book club. We thought, you know, it would be great if we could curate a collection of books together that we were interested in reading um, based on, you know, what our development plans were, what everybody wanted to grow skills at, how we wanted to learn the business. Um, so I am relatively new to banking. Uh, First Federal Lake was my first um job in the financial services sector and so you know there was an opportunity there for us to learn and grow um, together as a team so we pick books based on a wide variety of topics we've read everything from leading for growth which is the Umpqua bank story about how a smaller community bank turned into a large regional um, to see what we could learn from there maybe what we could do better at our day-to-day -day jobs um, we've read books from Adam Grant, um, his Give and Take book. I highly recommend that. It's about, um, you know, giving um, and balancing that, being a giver in your relationships and how that feeds back more, um, more and better value for you in, in your life and in your career. Um, to crucial conversations and how to listen. So getting down and driving to some core skills. Uh, and then most recently, we read The Notorious RBG. Um, and that was because that was a book where, you know, it was somebody that we all admired and really thought was, was a strong person who'd made a contribution and an effort in her field. Um, and we wanted to read and, and see what we could learn from that. And I think you can take learnings and apply it. And then we get together and we talk about it. Um, we'll do it over breakfast, so it feels like a fun, a fun event. Um, and we'll work those through. At, uh, at a, and that's that's marketing. Um, just over the last year, we've we've invited our HR partners to expand our book club. Um, so it just doesn't have to be departmental, but it did start with us as a way for us to get together and connect and grow as a team and learn together. Um, and then also at the bank, we have a more formalized leadership program. Um, it's a series, uh, usually over six months of trainings. Um, we do an in-depth uh, 360 review of ourselves and with our peers and our colleagues and, and have some day-long courses and training on some key management issues, uh, both for newer managers coming in and then um, more established management, the more established management team. Um, really, you know, we know that that is 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 valuable in growing and sustaining the organization and bringing up those next level of of leaders to continue um, to support the bank. So that's a that's a bank wide program that we've been doing now for the last couple of years. I think we have probably about five or six groups um, through through that pipeline, um, and that's been amazing because that's a cohort of. Um, different people from around the bank. So similar time to your mentorship program where you're getting people out of their um, normal business units and normal functional areas. That's what this, this uh, leadership program does. It brings people from different um, aspects of the organization together to cross pollinate some thinking and to work together and then to be sort of a cohort team and get together with that group um, 
after the classes are over and keep that keep that relationship building going with people outside of your core core working working team. So I know, Tom, you, you uh, at Heilman, you have Heilman U, which is a really fun program. We do. No, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. It's interesting that you brought up uh, active listening and crucial conversations because that were, were our, our last two classes were about that. Um, so Heilman U uh, came from an idea that I was talking with some of the team members and, and I hate to say it, but I've been in business, doing business for 20 years now. So what do I wish I would have known 20 years ago? Um, and what would those topics look like? And then how could we kind of uh, best deliver that to our team members starting out on their careers? So we came up with a list of about 40 different topics and tried to boil it down um, so from things. Um, so we do it once a month. We get together in our conference room and uh, essentially myself or another uh, one of the senior leaders will kind of give uh, a class on a specific topic. So our first class was about how does a professional services company work? What are the, uh, what are the basics of that? So, to level set that so everyone can understand that. And then, then we moved into active listening. And I think, Val, that's a foundational skill. Mm -hmm. if, we can't, uh, if you can't um, listen to folks and really hear what they're saying and read the cues, um, life's a lot more difficult. And the communication is two-sided, not only what you say, but what people hear. So we thought we'd start foundationally first with active listening and then move into crucial conversations. How do you have those? And then we're going to handle topics like time management, goal setting, planning things that are really foundational to helping you in both your career, but also in your per in your personal life, right? In terms of how can you be even more effective in those? So we established that as a way, it's totally optional. Uh, it's 8 a.m. right in the morning when everyone's everyone wants to come in to um, once a month to start that. And we've had great success, I think, with people attending that and, and learning it and hopefully leveraging that for some skills. We've also, one, one of the things we do, and I'm sure you do a similar thing, is we have an annual development plan mm -hmm. that the employee has to put together. Yeah. And they work on that with their manager. And of course, it depends on the area of the business. And so from our technology team, they may have more of a technical subject matter expertise bent. From our marketing team, it may be more around maybe marketing or advertising technology, or it may be around a, a specific industry or business that they want to, or business segment they want to learn more about. And as part of that, everyone has in the budget that we put together, uh, the ability to go to an annual, uh, to a conference or to a training. Now it could be a conference for some folks. Some folks like classroom learning. Some of it could be online learning. So we try to tailor it to what's best for that person or for perhaps that subject matter. But we invest in that, and it's actually part of your review and part of your bonus structures to make sure that you're meeting the growth-oriented core value that we have. I think that you do some more thing in the online learning space as well. We, we do, um, yeah. So um, when we develop our development plans, uh, they are probably 75% on the job, you know, the things that we've talked about already. And then holding some time for that book-based, conference-based um, education as part of the growth. If that's a specific skill, I know, um, uh, you know, we use LinkedIn Learning. Um, I know one of my uh, team members, she has an active interest in Google Analytics, and one of her goals was to be Google Analytics certified, so she's been carving out time to take those online classes. Um, I also really feel that it's a great opportunity for people to get out, whether it's, you know, local here and going in Cleveland, going to content marketing world or going to a bank marketing conference or, you know, something outside the industry that gives them a different perspective um, to be able to bring back. And then one of the things that we do is if you go to a conference, um, then when you come back within two weeks of coming back from the conference, um, putting together an action plan and sharing your key learnings and your key takeaways from that conference. And then what can we implement as an organization? So what are we going to do in our team? What are you going to bring back that you've learned at the conference um, to the team? And how's that going to make the team better? And we always have have action items and things that we are working towards or that, we're, that we've learned that we know will help um, influence our business and the way that we go to market for the bank. So that's um, been a great opportunity, but I think you need both. Um, you know, the, the willingness to send someone to an event, um, but then also the back end to say, okay, and how are we using this? Um, so many times, you know, if you've gone to a conference before, you come, you come back and you're like, that was really great. Right. That was wonderful. I learned so much. And three months later, it's 
oh man, yeah, that was a good conference. What what was what did I what did I learn again? Right. Um, so you know, keeping that recency and keeping it fresh in your mind, and having an action plan coming out of that conference about how you can bring what you learned back into your work environment uh, is so key. And it's one of the things we talk about as a team when when anyone goes away and comes back is is what have you learned and, and what are we going to implement or how are we going to change a process because of you having gone and yeah. experienced that. It's interesting. We do a similar thing when the, the, the toll or the price to go to the conference is um, the come back and give a lunch and learn oh, or yeah. give a pre presentation that comes back, right? And so the idea is a lot of times folks want to go to the same conferences. I would, I prefer, like organization, we prefer that people go to more conferences with different subjects in different mm -hmm. areas so that way we can bring more knowledge back and then hopefully share that within, um, within the team and, and make that collab through collaboration and through some of those mechanisms. Um, along that, in terms of ROI here, because I know what we're talking about ROI today, what I've seen, if I look at the if I look at the data on employee retention, uh, the people who um, go to the most conferences or the most engaged in the learning um, are always the people that are in my organization that stay the longest because mm -hmm. um, they're committed to the growth and they see the companies are committed to that. I would I would just, I'd, I'd be interested to hear if you think that a similar if you see a similar thing in your in your world as well. Um, you know, I, I, I do believe so. I mean, I think overarchingly, the more um, time invested um, definitely, you know, helps with that uh, retention. Um, I think, too, you know, I, I know we've gone um, to some events um, and have brought back new ways of doing things where I can't quantify how much we've saved, but because, you know, we've gone to a conference, maybe spent a couple thousand dollars to go to a conference, but we've come back and we've tweaked uh, some of our campaigns and now we're spending um, better and, you know, converting more leads. Yep. Um, we're seeing that value on the back end and, and it's, it's, it has staying power. Because the person, you know, retains that knowledge, they stay on the team, and you're continuing to use what you've learned um, to continue to, to be better. So I think that's what that's what we've really seen. Great. So I know we covered a lot of different subjects today. We talked about internships, we talked about mentorship, networking, career development groups, and then we talked about different mechanisms of ongoing um, education. I thought maybe what we could do in the, the, the final few minutes before we take some Q and A from um, the team or from the audience is talk about how would we get started, right? Because that's kind of the hardest part, right? In, in, in my experience, um, my experience is how do you get something like this off the ground and what's that take? And one of the things that we did to start was <clears throat> a while back, we uh, used a um, tool from Gallup, Strength Finders, mm -hmm. and we did a Strength Finders assessment, relatively inexpensive. It's a $20 book that you get the, the codes with, and it kind of understands, um, helps you understand what your strengths are as an individual. And, we do this for a few reasons. One, I think from if my, one of my beliefs is in education is know thyself. So if you want to start, know what you're really good at. And the data shows that if you're working on your strengths, you're way more engaged and more effective, right? But it also gave us a way, Val, for people to interact. And we have little cards, little three-by-five placards that we put on our desk that have your strengths on them. So when you're interacting with someone who maybe is analytical or strategic or, or, or relator, you may be looking at that and like, how do I best communicate to Val, right? How do I do that? And that was a way to kind of foster learning and for people kind of education and understanding. I thought it was kind of a good way uh, to get going. You know, it's funny because when we were prepping for this, when Tom and I were talking about this this webinar, um, I had mentioned Strength Finders too, and it was it was interesting to note that both of us had run through the Strength Finders exercise uh, with their teams when. When I was was new to the bank, it was a strength finders was something I'd used um, in in previous positions. And when I came to the bank, it was one of the first things I did. I had a brand new team. Um, we were all getting to know one another, and we all took the strength finders test. And then we shared each other's strengths. We figured out where the team was. And then from there, when I sat down with each person to do their individual development plan, you know, we pulled that document out. And we continue to do that and use the strength finders um, as a way to um, 
to make sure that we're maximizing uh, their development plans. I'll pull out their their uh, my, the team strength finders or my strength finders. You know, when I'm working on performance reviews or when I'm thinking about projects and maybe who would be the best lead for that if we've got a stretch project. Is this something that fits better with one person or the other? Um, and I use it as as part of my criteria. So. I think it's a great place to start. Like Tom said, the books are inexpensive. They give you access to the online quiz um, to get to your strengths, um, and they really provide a, an opportunity to have a rich discussion um, okay. and lead right into a uh, professional development plan right. um, and, and help you to create that plan because I think first and foremost, although we're ending with it, it's one of the key pieces, first and foremost, that development plan leads all of the activities uh, for for someone and, and being able to talk about it and review those. I know with my, with um, we review our development plans quarterly. Yeah. Uh, so we get out of the office. Um, and we really focus on, you know, what have we done in the last quarter? What have we done now looking back over the course of the year where, you know, we really feel like those skills have grown. When we look back on what our goals were for the year, how are we doing against those? Um, and having the plan and having the conversation helps you keep on track and keeps you focused. Um, it also keeps you focused on having a conversation around skill development and not performance. Right. And I think that that's that's really that's really key because it's a very fine line. So when you're developing the plans, it has to be in mind. You have to keep in mind that person's individual development needs along their career path, which obviously tie into right. where they have performance. Um, but you know, keeping that conversation really focused on skill development and not project or job performance results um, is, is a key part of why you have the plan. I think that's critical, too, because you separate the person from the performance, right? Correct. So the skills, so people are a lot more open to objective feedback about the skill. Like, Tom, you need to do a better job at listening, right? And that could be a loaded question if you say it one way, but if you say, well, if you look at our active listening skills, what kind of work have you done there? It's a lot easier to go, right? So I agree. The, the Getting an annual plan, looking reviewing it quarterly, I like the idea of being off-site because uh, it's amazing what the environment, changing an environment does for your mindset in terms of how you think. Mm -hmm. Seeing a couple things on more the financial side of things, I'm working on my 2019 budget right now, yeah. so it's near and dear to me. Um, is we put professional, we have, we put professional development and actually tra training and travel uh, for that both in our budgets, so that we can track. So for each person yeah. in the company, they have an allocation towards that. So it's critical, right, um, to be able to invest that. And then I think it ties to item four, right. Professional development, the, the cartoon that we had a couple slides back where, where the CFO said, what, what, what happens if we train all these, train the employees and they leave, make the investment, and you don't get a return? And then the CEO's answer, which I like a lot, is, uh, well, what if we don't train them and they stay, right? So we all want the most efficient, productive, happy, engaged employees we can. And I think um, allocating resources towards the professional development, and, and if, if, if it's a priority, it's in the budget. Right, and so budget set priorities in the, in, the, in a business context. So it's important to do both of those things. And I think the final point here before we go to questions, Val, is um, I think one of the things that you and I talked a little bit um, prior to uh, today, but let's talk about what does it take to so getting it off the ground is daunting, but you really don't have to have that many resources or that much to get it started, right? No, you really don't. I think I think sometimes, especially if if you're um, in an organization that maybe doesn't have a formalized program in place or, you know, is, is just has a budding program um, that shouldn't stop you from doing it in your own team. So, you know, you can influence your own team or even as an individual. Um, individual, you know, development plans really are owned by the employee. You know, they, they, they have to own those. So if you'll, if, if there's not a formal development program, ask for one. There's right. lots of resources out online where you can find plans and work with your manager or as a manager of a team, just start doing things. It costs nothing to have conversations. It's simply time, right? Simply time. Same with mentorship. It, you know, going out, having a cup of coffee, you know, if you spent $10 
every quarter on having coffee conversations with your team. What's that going to do? What's a you know twenty dollar book if you've got three people on your team? How is that changing the engagement and the dedication of the team and their willingness to bring themselves to the table? Because so it doesn't have to be this big blown out. Um, corporate initiative or, or um, company-wide initiative, um, you can start grassroots with your own team um, and you can see, you know, and start to show the value of that in the way that your team comes to the table with their business partners and with their colleagues around them. Um, and, you know, one of those rising tides lift all boats, you know, you start small and it grows and it builds. Um, and you get the out of it as a manager the ability to watch and see your team grow and develop, and you know you grow and develop out of that. So it's it's uh, incredibly rewarding. Yes, absolutely. So I think um, Scott's <laughs> waving at me with some questions here. So we have about I think about five minutes left. I thought Val, we could take some questions from the. Uh, the audience here. Scott, I don't know if you wanted to start us out with one. Yeah, yeah, it looks like we had a few questions come through during the presentation. Uh, first one here, what are some of the challenges of starting an internship program? You want that or you mean? Um, challenges of starting an internship program. Um, you know, the big, I'll tell you that one of the biggest ones for us was where to look. You know, how we didn't want to just put a job description out there and put it on Indeed or, you know, wherever. So how do you, um, how do you get those relationships? And, and we are fortunate. We, um, I mentioned our compliance department earlier, who's got a great and robust internship program and they work very close with BW. So they were able to share their contact at BW to introduce us. Um, a couple members of my team still had relationships with their college marketing departments. So we were able to go back there. Um, it's really simply, it feels overwhelming, but it's really simple to pick up the phone and call the Cleveland State Marketing Department and say you have an internship program available. The local colleges in our community are willing, able, and 100% behind helping you find talent. Um, so it actually makes it really, really easy. And then like Tom says, budget for it. Put that person in your budget and make a commitment to carve out um, a little bit of your budget to support having somebody on your, uh, having that person um, join your team. Great. Thank you. Um, Tom, I guess I'll throw this one your way. Uh, how do you get the team engaged uh, to want to do these things? Great question, Scott. I saw you grinning about BWs. Uh, <laughs> you're a BW grad, so they're, it's all good. Um, so, uh, it's interesting. People often ask, how do you, so we do a lot of things. We have high menu, mentorship, annual development plans, conferences, internship programs, all these things they do. And they see a lot of through our social media, we share a lot of what our interns do, doing a lot of these fun things. And people ask me, how do we get people to want to do that? And my argument is that um, I almost never have to, ask, I almost never have to ask, I almost have to hold people back. You want to create an environment when we Recruit people, we look for growth orientation, which is our way, fancy way of saying they want to learn and want to grow. Uh, and if you have the right people on the team and the culture, your culture is there, um, you're, you're going to see it. You're going to see your employees just want to do more. You may have a few thought starters of, hey, what do we think about a mentorship program or how do we do that? So we try to cultivate it in our hiring and looking for the, that growth, uh, specifically both of our businesses, right? If you look at the industry, financial services is rapidly changing. Uh, marketing, technology, creative is, is certainly changing uh, every day. And so I think, Scott, it comes down to providing a few thought starters, providing some seed money. Um, and I usually, if people are willing to invest their time and energy uh, into it, I'll throw some money into it and we'll see what happens. But uh, it really, I think, comes down to the people that you hire to just be that, um, that engaged and that willing to commit to their career. I mean, I think you hit on a key, key part of that, that it starts in the hiring process. You know, when we're looking for new team members, we're looking for that, for that learner, for that, for that learner quality. And we ask questions specifically targeted to understand if that person is a fit. Um, we've just recently gone through a hiring of a new team member um, on our team. And that was a key, key part of, 
of my questioning and working with the team was, is it a culture fit? fit? Is this person going to be open to spending some of their free time reading book club books <laughs> and, you know, having discussions and being being open to those things? So I, that's, that's key in the hiring process. We, we say hire for hire for culture fit, training yeah. skill. True. Uh, I think we got one more here. Uh, yeah. So our last question here, um, how would you sell this to your CEO or, or how would you prove that it's a worthwhile investment? What's the elevator pitch on that? Yeah. I'm like, I'll start with that one. Um, well, since I'm selling myself, I guess that's uh, easier. But if I when, when I talk to clients and other folks on why to do these things, um, I think it all comes down to almost that, the little cartoon we showed, right? We want to have the most engaged um, uh, workforce you possibly can. The productivity skyrockets, the, which means your profitability and your operational efficiency skyrockets. So I usually say if you're not going to invest in people – then you're going to need to expect them to leave or expect poor performance. So the only option is to invest so that you get the best possible people, you pay them well, you train them, and they, they train themselves essentially in that model. So that investment yields um, long-term commitment, and it, it also helps if the people see the company's willing to invest and then the culture sees that the company's willing to grow. People. I think. True. And, I mean, I will harken back all the way to our first slide where we talked about the state of the American workplace in Gallup. And... One of the things that they found coming out of that survey, and time and time again, if you um, you know read anything and you keep up with Gallup and employee engagement surveys, um, one of the top reasons that people leave a company, even more so than pay, is career growth opportunities. Yep. So if you want to keep people and you want a retention, you have to invest. In, in your employees or else you're going to be investing in a revolving door of training costs. And recruiting. And yeah. recruiting costs, yeah. which is much more expensive than having a, a development program that um, keeps and improves your talent. Exactly. Awesome. Well, well, great. And uh, it looks like we're, we're just about out of time here. So, Valerie, thank you for joining us today. Tom, thank you for your insights as well. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll be sending out a recording of today's webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to us at, at Heilman Group or First Federal Lakewood. Uh, and uh, uh, have a great rest of your day.